Welcome to Portland's Sustainability Series. My name is Meg Gray. I'm a science and technology librarian here, and I'm one of the co-hosts with Jessica Burton, the executive director of uh, the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. And I'm pleased to kick off tonight's event with a land acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is a simple way of showing respect and a step toward correcting the stories and practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture and toward inviting and honoring the truth. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the occupied and unceded territory of the Wabanaki, the people of the place where the sun first looks our way, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot Nations, and all the native communities who have lived in Chihuahuankeg for over 3,000 generations in what is now called New England and the Canadian Maritimes. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Portland Sustainability Series is a monthly event here. It's on the fourth Wednesday of every month. Next month we'll be meeting the first week of December due to the Thanksgiving holiday, and we're excited to have Troy Moon um, come to talk to us about the, uh, the project that he's doing with South Portland. Um, before I hand it over to Jess to do the introduction, um, part of my job is obviously thinking about sustainability and what that means. And in the past year, the American Library Association actually adopted sustainability <coughs> among its core values. Um, intellectual freedom and uh, education, things like that, are sort of what people think about when they think about librarianship. But um, I, I copied this from their website today because I thought that it was really perfect for tonight's event. <coughs> ALA is supporting the library community by showing its commitment to assisting in the development of sustainable libraries with the addition of sustainability as a core value of librarianship. This consists of practices that are environmentally sound, economically feasible, and socially equitable. Libraries play an important and unique role in promoting community awareness about resilience, climate change, and a sustainable future. Thank you. Um, one housekeeping note, there is an event in the Lewis Gallery this evening, so as you exit, just ask that you take a right through reference and go up the stairs and elevators there. So, without further ado, just to do the introduction. Thanks, Meg. Um, I also give a big thanks to the Portland Public Library for uh, co-hosting the series, the Sustainability Series. I think we're in our third or fourth year, and we have had just an amazing um, variety of speakers. Um, <coughs> I would also like to thank our co-sponsors co for this event tonight and fellow collaborators who helped ensure that we could present this full evening to all of you. Um, and those organizations include the Nature Conservancy of Maine, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, Maine Initiatives, the Foundation for Public, Portland Public Schools, and the Telling Room. Showing you, our community, that all of these different organizations can find opportunities to partner and to do so in support of the Wabanaki is a wonderful outcome of this event. So thank you to all of you from those organizations that are here with us tonight. The Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative is a network of 22 land and water conservation organizations committed to making the conversation about conservation broader acknowledging and acting upon the wide connections and relevancies for greater impact in healthier communities. And we are especially committed to building a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse conservation movement. Maine celebrates its 200th year in 2020. There is a lot to celebrate about the people and the projects of this state, especially from the last year. However, we know that Maine was founded on stolen land, and we know that Maine was the last state in the country to give voting rights to indigenous people. We also know that the impact on native cultures from their disposition of land is devastating. Loss of language, identity, chronic health issues, internalized racism, ghost and lost generations. These facts create an enormous opportunity for reckoning. Big changes in our behavior and action are possible through acknowledgement of injustices. Conservation 
has a role in supporting the Wabanaki sovereignty. We have a responsibility as stewards of this place to deepen our understanding of what decolonizing conservation might look like. <coughs> Tonight, I am excited to learn about a different yet similar process. We are pleased and honored to present tonight's event, and we welcome Star Kelly. Thank you so much. Star is the curator of Edu Hold. The curator of education at Abbey Museum. Her responsibilities focus on education through dialogue in a decolonizing context. Star leads the museum's education and public programs work, including program development and delivery, teacher training, and educational resource development. She is a member of the Algonquin First Nation of Kitigan, ZB, and Ish no, I'm sorry, Anishinaabeg in Quebec. Star has worked as a middle and high school social studies teacher and is a social justice oriented educator, developing what she refers to as curriculum for dignity. Her lessons and pedagog pedagogical approach put theory into practice by honoring those she teaches about, while simultaneously creating an environment which is responsible to the needs of her learners and dignifies her students' lived experiences. <clears throat> Star is committed to language and cultural revitalization efforts in indigenous communities. She is a traditional bead worker in both flat and raised beadwork mediums and enjoys hiking and live music <laughs> in her spare time. It's from the website, yeah. Star is a board member of the main archives and museums where she serves on both the programs and communications committees. So needless to say, we have a lot to look forward to in this talk. And again, I welcome and thank you so much. Hi everybody, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me in the back. Um, I like being a little bit further away from the mic, but um, I wanna thank you all for coming out here and I wanna thank for all the sponsors for um, inviting the Abbey to be part of this series. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about the work that I do and the, the work that my museum does um, in, in an emerging um, type of work within the museum field. Um, and we'll, of course, delve into that. But um, we also have a land acknowledgement that we read at the beginning of all of our events. Um, this land acknowledgement um, is actually an extension of our decolonizing process. It took about two years to produce. We produced it in collaboration with our Native Advisory Council. Uh, it was a very deliberate choice that was led by um, Native people at the table deciding on the language that they wanted to consider around how we acknowledge the land, how we recognize the land, and how we recognize the violence that has been perpetrated against the land and um, against Wabanaki peoples. And so I'm going to begin um, uh, my section with um, the Abbey Museum land acknowledgement. Um, we are in the land, uh, homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the Don. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all of the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is now known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. We make this acknowledgement aware of the continual violations of water, territorial rights, and sacred sites in the Wabanaki homeland. The Abbey is honored to collaborate with the Wabanaki as they tell their own stories. And you'll see a lot of um, institutions now adopting um, different land acknowledgements. And I think it is an important step in the right direction, but as, um, um, as Meg mentioned, it's like one step Right, it's only like a beginning step, and that, um, and in fact, a lot of what the work that needs to be done is a lot deeper than just acknowledging the land. So, um, I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about who I am and how I came to do this type of work, and um, help kind of shed some light on how I actually approach decolonization, both within the classroom, within museum education, and then as um, to the museum world as a whole. So. Um, I am um, uh, a citizen of Kirigan Zibi Anishinaabek. 
Um, I actually grew up in Southern Maine. My family moved here in the 90s, and I'm a Portland High graduate, um, so I'm happy to be back in the area. Uh, I love it here. <laughs> um, I did go to Colgate University in Central New York, um, where I graduated with um, uh, an undergraduate degree in Native American Studies, and then went on to get my Master's of Teaching at Colgate with a concentration in Secondary Social Studies education. That particular program is really focused on um, a social justice oriented um, uh, pedagogical, uh, pedagogical uh, approach in the classroom. And so I really um, can, uh, attribute a lot of the ways I think about museum education to that background that I have inside the classroom. Um, my graduate thesis work was around decolonizing methodologies for um, indigenous education, really focused on how indigenous people can um, um, self-determine the, the needs that our students need in, in our own classrooms. And then, of course, I have um, some classroom experience working both at Santa Fe Indian School in New Mexico and then in central New York, New York as well. A quick overview of what I'm going to be speaking about tonight. Um, first thing first, I have to de uh, define decolonization as, as hard it is, as it is to create a really clear um, uh, definition of something that's really broad and really um, always changing, especially to the needs of what's happening today. Um, I am going to attempt to um, help you understand and grapple with um, what we mean by decolonization at the Abbey Museum and how other scholars have um, come to think about this work as well. Um, I'll also be um, We'll be considering the um, background of the history of uh, museums as colonizing forces, as perpetrators of a great violence against uh, indigenous peoples. And we'll also be thinking about um, museum decolonization um, methodology and the ways in which this shows up uh, at the work being done at the Abbey Museum. And then, of course, we'll be talking about a little bit about um, how I how I like to incorporate it into museum education, and then the implications for all of us. Um, everybody in this room um, has ties to how how history is remembered and how we tell stories and share stories. And so, I'll be sharing a little um, a little bit about how I think all of us in this room can start to consider uh, decolonization on a really broad uh, scale. So before we get much further, uh, let's talk about what it is we are talking about. Um, decolonization is not an easy definition to create as it's really determined by the local tribal communities and histories um, and the practice of um, the local histories and, and the practices that have been done by various institutions. But when done properly, each organization will reflect decolonization in very different ways. Um, at the Abbey Museum, we use the um, work of Amy Lone Tree, who wrote um, Decolonizing Museums in 2012. And um, she writes that museums can be very painful sites for Native peoples, as they are intimately tied to the colonization process. And we look, when we look at the ways in which museums are connected to um, the colonization process, it's really evident how these um, practices continue to harm Indigenous peoples today. Um, Susan Miller um, is a seminal um, scholar working um, primarily in archaeology and um, as she was considering what decolonization would mean within, archaeolo within an archaeological context, she actually um, attempted to define it uh, and she describes decolonization as a process designed to shed light and recover from the ill effects of colonization. And together tonight, um, we'll, be able, we'll be speaking about these ill effects in the museum spaces and looking at um, the establishment of collecting institutions as agents of settler colonialism. So right here, I actually am providing you with the current um, Abbey Museum definition of what decolonize, decolonization actually means. Um, this is a working definition, meaning that it is not um, set in stone, it's meant to be continually um, looked at and continually um, considered um, depending on where the work kind of um, is led by our um, Native Advisory Council. Um, and so um, our current uh, definition is decolonization means at a minimum the sharing of authority for the documentation and interpretation of Native culture. Decolonizing practices at the Abbey are collaborative with tribal communities privilege native perspective and voice, and include the full measure of history, ensuring truth-telling. 
And in all honesty, I think um, we're already outgrowing this definition. Um, we haven't necessarily had that conversation yet, but just reflecting on it in preparation for today, I was looking at this and I was thinking about this idea of, of sharing authority and how even now the Abbey is thinking about it beyond just this idea of documentation and interpretation, right? This idea that authority needs to be shared at every level of the museum, especially a museum like the Abbey, um, in order to actually realize the goals of decolonization. And um, at this point, I do want to delve into the history of, of museum representation of indigenous peoples um, so that we can understand why there is a need for decolonizing methodologies now and um, understand that the histories of, of collecting institutions and in particular of museums um, really um, they, they owe a great, um, they owe a lot to indigenous peoples, understanding that a lot of these places have um, created in, uh, tremendous amounts of wealth and um, created uh, collections based on the theft of many indigenous objects. So the history of museum representation of native peoples begins with the development of anthropology as an academic field. And while there are museums that have existed in earlier histories, modern day representation stems from the late 19th and 20th century anthropologists um, who are making their careers off uh, systematically collecting American Indian material culture. This was at a time too where Indians were thought to be a vanishing people from the landscape. So in this gap, um, the academy anthrop anthropologists were creating our understanding of native people. These, these were not informed by indigenous perspectives, but were in fact um, from a co uh, colonizing perspective. Um, large collecting, collecting institutions uh, such as the Smithsonian, which was uh, founded in 1846, the Peabody Museum of Archaeology um, and Ethnology at Harvard, and New York's um, Museum of Natural History, and of course Chicago's Field Museum, all were the primary um, initial um, big collectors of uh, Native American material cultures. Um, all of these institutions were very aggressive collectors. For example, the Smithsonian's collection grew from 550 items in 1860 to more than 13,000 items in 1873. So within 13 years, you know, it's exponentially growing. And when we think about this time in history, we have to really consider what's happening in the United States around that time. And we have to understand what's happening in the field of anthropology. It's this exploding um, field of study of which, um, if you're familiar, you know, this idea of kind of collecting um, these objects to store away from their original context. And the implications this will have for um, indigenous people are, are huge. Uh, and at this time, we also see uh, museums, particularly um, natural history museums, actually creating systems of classification. So these are going hand in hand, different types of classifications. Um, if you've ever been to a natural history museum, you've probably seen you know, the, the halls of the American Indian, or you're, you're, you're looking at the, the large megafauna, right? the extinct megafauna, almost right next to the hall of American Indians. And so you can start to understand how museums are actually already starting to create a narrative, right? They're connecting this idea of extinction of disappearance of indigenous peoples to these ideas of extinction of um, mega, uh, megafauna from the Ice Age. <clears throat> so simultaneously during the rise of anthropology, we also have detrimental Indian policy occurring in this country, which sought to destroy the sovereign rights of tribes through the Dawes Act, the creation of the boarding schools for forced assimilation, the outlawing of specific indigenous ceremonies and religious traditions, and the attempt to physically ro relocate tribes, and of course the creation of the reservation system. And so when we're looking at that time of, of museum collections growing, this is when the federal government is really attacking um, uh, indigenous sovereignty. Uh, anthropologists and collectors were entering communities when they were at their most vulnerable, often taking advantage of the situation to extract as much as they physically could to put into storage. They sought to collect the authentic um, from a people they saw as vanishing and on the brink of extinction. Um, I can't go any further without actually recognizing some of the, 
the gravest um, violations that museums have participated in. Um, and it's hard for me to talk about sometimes, in all honesty, um, when we consider that museums have participated in the taking and storing of our ancestors. Um, I don't necessarily enjoy um, sharing this history, but I really think it's important because not everybody always considers it when, they are, when they're thinking about museums and the kinds of violence that has been perpetrated against indigenous people. Um, so uh, Amy Lone Tree, again, she's a Ho-Chunk scholar and she wrote uh, Decolonizing Museums, which I highly recommend. Um, she writes in her book that modern anthropology and archeology span and museum practice was founded in great part to violating human rights. And she's referring to this taking of the ancestors. And what she's referring to the taking of um, human remains and putting them into um, museums for study. Um, so at the same time that native objects are being collected, so too are human, were human remains, especially during the early 19th century when scholars began using human remains to ex explain physical and cultural differences between peoples. The collecting of crania was, a popular, was popular among scholars who attempted to relate intelligence, personality, and character to skull and brain size. And of course, this, was a study, this study relates to the, sorry, I lost my, set, <laughs> my place. Um, uh, these cranial measurements were um, used to validate uh, white supremacy and um, also helped, to, um, helped within the study of eugenics and really um, took off in the late 19th century and continued until um, and through World War II. Um, the taking of our ancestors is, is very much tied to the scientific basis of, of racist structures in this country, and, and it does help to legitimize or uh, an attempt to legitimize the colonization of these lands. Uh, Franz Boas, um, who was one of um, the founding um, individuals within um, cultural anthropology was known for, uh, really well known for um, uh, collecting the oral traditions of Northwest Coast tribes, but he also collected a great number of bodies. Um, and he often um, wrote about robbing graves after dark and taking really detailed notes in his field journal. So this meant that this practice was being institutionalized, it was being normalized, and that he was openly sharing it with his colleagues. So he was talking about the, or he was actually taking um, notes about, about these thefts from, from the land that he was taking. Um, and during his early days alone, he collected approximately uh, 100 complete skeletons, 200 skulls, and um, mostly sold these to the Field Museum in Chicago and later parties um, in Berlin, Germany. And of course, <laughs> I'm not sure um, how familiar uh, everybody in the audience is with the um, native graves, uh, native, sorry, uh, native graves and Native American Graves and Repatriation Act that was passed in 1990. But when this was actually being passed, it was an attempt to um, help repair some of the the damage that had been done among uh, collecting. Um, parties and especially um, considering the repatriation of ancestors and ancestral um, burial goods to communities um, that needed these to be um, returned and uh, returned back to the earth. But at that time in 1990, um, it was estimated that museums, federal agencies, and private collectors um, held about 2.5 million Native American bodies and untold millions of um, cultural objects in their um, storage areas. And to this day, it remains to be estimated that about half a million Native American indi individuals are still held in U.S. Uh, collections, and an equal number are held in uh, European collections. So there's still quite a number of ancestors still being held in these institutions. And I, I can't underplay how, incredible, how incredibly harmful this is. Um, and these particular practices um, have been and still do cause a lot of harm within our communities. And when you consider that even after death, we are not safe um, and that we can be violated once we are put to rest, it's no wonder that there's a lot of distrust between indigenous communities and, uh, and the museum field. Uh, and when we, when we consider you know, the full completion of our, our lives as indigenous people, that is like the final step.
right? That, that's how you complete your life cycle. And, and to be um, disturbed from that is, um, is really damaging for, for us. And I, I often say, like, if we can't see the eye to eye on the sanctity of, like, my ancestors who need to be returned, then decolonizing efforts really can't move forward from that. Like, this is, this is the baseline, right? I need you to see me as a human being. I need you to see my ancestors as a human being. And then we can start talking about everything else that should be done within an institution. Um, um, uh, many uh, institutions that do come to ask the Abbey about um, how and where they should start within a decolonizing framework, I often, um, and my other colleagues will often ask, like, are you compliant with NAGPRA, right? Are you receiving federal funds? Are you required to, to um, engage um, uh, in repatriation of, of ancestors to people? And, and if they haven't, then that's, that's the first place you start, right? That's the first place where you can even think of gaining any sort of trust, um, any, uh, any sort of um, starting place with, with communities in, in their areas. <clears throat> I wanted um, to also take a moment to, to consider how decolonization actually came to be as, um, as an idea for self-determination and where those roots really lie. Um, um, when I, I personally can't separate the importance of the American Indian movement and the, uh, the rise of decolonizing efforts within the museum field. Um, as a result of the American Indian movement, um, acts like uh, the American Indian Religious Freedoms Act, which sought to protect indigenous religious practices for the first time in 1978, and of course the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, this movement had um, huge implications for um, indigenous peoples and indigenous communities who were um, fighting for self-determination within their communities. Understanding that um, during this time in the 1970s, people were pushing to um, take control of education. No, understanding that we need to have, be able to um, educate our own children and um, set our standards for ourselves. Uh, physical occupations of spaces like Alcatraz and Wounded Knee were responsive and proactive measures towards self-determination among indigenous peoples and um, really started People really started to think about this not just within um, not just within education, not just within um, um, uh, tribal law, not just within um, you know all the, all the various aspects of life, but people started to also think about um, museums and how museums have historically taken on um, narrative control of who indigenous peoples are and um, understanding that this was a time when people also were starting to question how objects ended up in museum collections. I, um, I also want to recognize the work of indigenous artists um, who have and continue to challenge um, museum displays of in, uh, native peoples and cultures. Um, and Despite the American Indian movement, museums have been incredibly slow to this change and incredibly slow to, to rethinking the process in which um, indigenous peoples um, are put on display and in the ways in which ancestors are put on display and the way in which um, cultural material is put on display. And so um, uh, native performers like James Luna here on um, over there on the left, <laughs> um, he, he really, rock the art world when he did this. He put on a performance piece called Artifact, in which he actually laid himself out, out on display. And so he, he had himself on a, in a very large case and um, he had various items out uh, in other cases next to him, various parts of his material culture. He had a pack of cigarettes, he had um, his baseball cap, he had he had a rattle that was important to him. He also um, had his divorce papers out on display. And so <laughs> to consider and to kind of um, turn on ahead what we think of as material culture, what do we think of as authentic Indian culture, he wanted to all of the visitors in the audience to really consider like, what do we mean by that? What do you, what does the audience expect from an indigenous person, from an indigenous, um, uh, material culture, right? Um, he, when he was on display, he did not interact with anybody. He was just 
laid out there. Um, he had various um, labels describing all sorts of scars and how he got them throughout his life. Um, and uh, people often were, were disturbed. They didn't always understand why he was doing this, but he, um, he did this at a very in interesting institution. He actually did this at the San Diego Museum of Man, which has a very long and complicated histories uh, um, around displaying ancestors, so actual human remains of James, James's um, uh, ancestors. And so um, t for him to do this so early on in 1987, I really think uh, it sparked a lot of conversations within the museum field and within the art field. And um, it even was later revisited by um, Erica Lord in which she also did that again to consider has, much, has, has there been a lot of change within, within the museum field around these really important issues. So um, identifying the issues with museum history is an important aspect of understanding the need for decolonizing methodologies so that museums are no longer harmful spaces for uh, native peoples. Um, and can we imagine new futures for museums in which indigenous knowledge and perspectives are centered, a place where we control our own stories and are able to address traumas that have happened in the past? Um, really early work that has been done around um, these methodologies and where, where they're kind of stemming from actually come from um, this one book on the, on the left, uh, the, Na uh, the National Museum of the American Indian Critical Conversations by Amy Lone Tree and Amanda Cobb. Um, these had various essays inside in which uh, people within uh, the National Museum of the American Indi Indian and outside were discussing um, how this brand new museum at the time um, both succeeded and how it did not um, in, in attempting to create something new within the museum field around, um, in, uh, around um, native museums. Um, and then um, secondly, I, I do wanna mention decolonizing museums. Um, Dr. Lone Tree's work has uh, fundamentally, fundamentally um, shifted the Abbey Museum and has definitely been the basis uh, from which we are working. So we really do rely heavily on her frameworks uh, that she established in this book, Decolonizing Museums. Um, but she, in this book in 2012, she really delves deeper into the subject um, with a focus on exhibits. And she looks at um, various museums and really um, tries to evaluate um, where they are kind of on the scale of decolonization um, and, in, and includes the importance of understanding the historical relationship between indigenous peoples and museums. So she's also um, a really big advocate of understanding the history of museums so that we can build uh, better institutions that um, are no longer harmful. And so um, right here, we actually offer um, the, um, the framework that uh, Amy Lone Tree um, puts out. Um, and there are certainly museums across the United States and even around the globe that are in, um, incorporating decolonizing practices in their operations. But, we, but we, what we found as an institution when we wanted to take this on, um, there, I even found this document a couple days ago, um, there's um, a lot of research that we wanted to do. We wanted to know if, if people were already doing this or not. We wanted to see where they were on, um, on the kind of the scale of decolonizing work. And, um, and it really, what, what we found in what I read in those documents is that the Abbey found that most of the decolonizing work that has been done and is still being done is mostly within the realm of exhibits. And that's it. So the things that the public, you are gonna see when you enter into, um, into a space. And so and a lot of that really has to do with uh, collaboration. So, oh yeah, we worked with this tribe, so we're a decolonizing museum, right? Like, this is a really good exhibit, that, you know? And so yeah, of course we're decolonized. Um, but instead, what, what Amy is arguing for and, and what we are as an institution um, arguing for is that um, all of these areas of decolonizing work need to go beyond just exhibits. And, um, and while we are certainly concerned with exhibits um, at the Abbey as well, um, we're looking at all of our operations. So we're looking at governance structures, we're looking at um, hiring practices, we're looking at collections management, we're looking at educational programming, um, our development team, how do we fundraise for money, and of course um, looking forward um, to creating like new decolonizing pathways. 
So um, Amy um, identifies three elements of decolonizing um, methodology. The first, collaboration. The second, um, privileging indigenous perspectives and voices. And the third, uh, truth telling. <laughs> So by collaboration, um, again, borrowing from Amy, um, uh, this really means a, a, a true collaboration between tribal partners and the Abbey Museum. Um, and when we think about how exhibits, for example, are conceived, are we already creating an exhibit and then getting um, permission to put it on display? Or are we actually creating um, exhibits in conjunction with people from the communities? Um, are we thinking about the types of collaboration around um, educational events that uh, people want to see us do? Um, and are we thinking about the collaborative needs that are threaded throughout the life of a project? And so at every stage of a project, are we still continuously engaging Wabanaki nations? Um, <laughs> so the way that we really think about this is um, a lot of people will, will think about um, exhibits around consulting. So instead, we want to look beyond just consultation into real power sharing uh, and understanding that um, all our projects um, and all of the operations of the museum really should be collaborative and really should be about seeding that, that the power that museums traditionally have had and thinking about um, ways in which um, uh, we can start building paths forward for power sharing. Uh, the privileging of a, a native voice and perspective. This second uh, characteristic um, is actually this idea of uh, how vast amounts of writings have already been produced from uh, white colonizing perspectives. But is it possible to have a space that is a Wabanaki voice or is coming from a Wabanaki perspective or a space that is privileging um, Wabanaki voices so that all the different narratives of Wabanaki history and experiences here in their own homeland um, can be coming from them themselves. And then of course truth-telling that really gets at um, this idea of um, of understanding that the the histories of Wabanaki uh, people uh, the issues of today are very much connected to um, to traumas of, of, that have happened historically among um, Wabanaki peoples and understanding that we as an institution have um, a really big responsibility to, to be really truthful in our telling of history and that we don't want to um, gloss over difficult issues and that it's really important for us to um, tell that full measure of history. Um, I, I do want to say, like, when we think about this particular framework, um, when you're following a framework like this, you have to embrace a lot of the complexity that comes with it, and you really have to get comfortable with uh, unfinished business and learning to work in the gray. Um, because there aren't a lot of institutions doing this, a lot of it, it just comes from listening to people and understanding that, you know, there aren't, there aren't, um, there are no manuals for doing this work, and, and even for me to even consider like us writing a manual, it would never work anywhere else. You know, like we can share our experiences, but it's always going to be very, very different depending on your institution, your history with the communities, and of course, um, um, just the communities themselves. What, what, what do communities want out of a partnership with somebody like the Abbey Museum? So questions that the Abbey needed to consider when creating new spaces like our permanent exhibit. Um, how can Wabanaki stories be centered in our spaces? How can we interweave various perspectives from within communities to tell a more dynamic story of history? Which contemporary issues should be highlighted in these spaces? Um, which stories do we not have the authority to share? Because sometimes it is about people making hard lines saying, you know, you don't have the right to share that story. That's something that we need to share and that's something for us, but not necessarily for the public. And it's about being okay when people say no to you. Um, and historically in, within museums, we've always thought, oh, information's for everybody. Um, these stories are for everybody. And, and you don't necessarily have the right to tell us no. But when we think about the heart of decolonizing work and we think about the fact that 
self-determination self-determination is very much linked to that that sovereignty is very much linked to this process then we have to consider that there are going to be times when we we don't have the authority to share um, certain stories and of course what are our responsibilities to wabanaki nations um, in in all of our spaces um, and in particular, we wanted to think about um, developing decolonizing methodologies just beyond exhibits. So some areas of considerations that we wanted to um, include were collections, operations, governance, our strategic planning, uh, programming, programming and events, advocacy, and fundraising. And we now as an institution have um, created a commitment towards decolonizing practice and all of this is available online on our website but in our uh, strategic plan we did adopt um, an in institutional mandate to continue this work of decolonizing um, and so a lot of uh, the part of decolonizing is being transparent so understanding that when we say that we're committing to something like this we actually need to have this accessible to everybody online and so understanding that even in the process you can kind of check off where we are in our strategic plan. Um, some more recent outcomes of our decolonizing methodology actually has to do around um, our governance protocol, which is always uh, evolving. And later I'll, I'll share um, how I think that this is gonna be one of the biggest areas of change in the coming year. Um, we also adopted a religious appropriation and spirituality practice protocol. Um, and we've also been doing a lot of work around archaeology. So the history of the Abbey Museum in particular is very much linked to archaeology. And as we already discussed, there, there's been a lot of harm done by um, uh, the archaeological field and um, archaeological museums, which the Abbey Museum started out with. And so um, with that, we used to run a field school. We used to um, have you know archaeological events that people would come to. And to understand that, um, as an institution, we decided not to be an archaeological museum. We decided to be uh, a museum that goes beyond just that multidisciplinary, as I like to think about it. Um, understanding, um, we have this really great quote that um, archaeology is only one way of understanding the world, and that instead we should be incorporating all these other really wonderful ways of understanding the world. So history, anthropology, yes, and of course, oral stories, art, like these are all like the various aspects of our lives and it makes for such a more interesting and dynamic story. And um, it really helps with various avenues in which Wabanaki people can come and help share their own stories the way that they want to share them. And so, um, what I was trying to get at was, <laughs> so we've moved beyond just archaeology and, and thinking about ways in which um, archaeology kind of has to take a back seat at the museum currently, but thinking also that there are indigenous archaeologists and how can we work with indigenous archaeologists to, to work on the kind of research that they want to Put on and so we actually put together um, just recently last weekend I was just there at our archaeological advisory committee in which we are considering um, uh, new ways forward around research and, and around um, utilizing the, the the archaeological materials we already have. So we have a lot of archaeological materials that haven't even been studied yet. And so creating opportunities for, for Wabanaki professionals to, to um, start going through some of those collections instead of continuously digging up more and more stuff, right? Well, that's not the point anymore. Um, so I, I wanted to quickly, since I am a museum educator, I wanted to think about um, a decolonizing framework within a museum education uh, lens. And of course, um, utilizing Dr. Lone Tree's um, uh, uh, framework. Um, we understand that collaboration, of course, is really important. So um, in the educational department, we, we want to um, highlight Wabanaki expertise by having individuals lead their own programs in Abbey spaces and beyond. And also understanding um, this second one. It's kind of been like bubbling up a little bit in my head. I've been trying to think about the ways in which, especially lately, um, how to be a trusted partner to Wabanaki people, how um, when individuals in the communities who often do a lot of educational outreach are coming to me and saying, oh, you know, I don't have enough time to answer all these teachers' emails, but I know I can trust you, and I know that I can send them to you or give them your email. That's a really incredible moment, right? That you know that, um, 
they they can trust you to to be a resource for for educators and for various um, districts within the state and so that collaboration is really really important and it is based on trust and it is an understanding that um, we have a responsibility to help alleviate some of that workload because people within the communities are you know over in um, they get a lot of emails <laughs> for oh, sorry uh, for uh, programming and for um, for helping with um, with various projects throughout the state, and then um, also um, the the need for museum education to really understand the ways in which we can humanize the past and the ways in which often the history of indigenous peoples are almost the center of the story. But how can we actually weave stories that are both present? and of the past and the ways in which we can make really dynamic conversations and really facilitate um, wonderful, responsive um, conversations around contemporary issues and understanding that they are very much linked to the colonial past. So if we're talking about water rights or if we're talking about um, uh, indigenous uh, Native American mascots, you know, we understand that these have really long, deep um, historical implications and so, um, I always try to think of ways in which we can really prioritize Wabanaki perspective, but also think about the dignity that is really required within this work um, to think of, about how we talk about the past. And of course, truth telling. Um, I'm a really big advocate for truth telling and for considering um, how our programming can really help people um, unpacked issue, unpack issues around settler colonialism and around issues of sovereignty. Um, I, I find that uh, for the most part the general public ha aren't really familiar with thinking about sovereignty and thinking about um, Wabanaki nations or, or other tribal nations as sovereign entities, right, with their own government and their own um, um, needs for self-determination. And so a lot of my work is really about um, helping people get comfortable with talking about that and at least opening a door for you to continue your own education around those issues. Um, a lot of my other work actually um, is still within classrooms. I'm really, I'm really happy I get to still work with a lot of teachers and I still get to work with districts. Um, I'm working really closely with Portland Public Education right now um, and um, in particular they have a really great collaborative approach um, which I'm really really uh, impressed by, uh, in which they are working very closely with representatives from Wabanaki nations. Um, but I thankfully have been also invited to at least um, help relieve some of the burden of, of educating edu uh, teachers as well. And so a lot of what I um, consider for classroom education and, and thoughts around uh, curriculum structure actually comes from my experience in the, in the classroom and a lot of my um, frustrations with being a social studies educator. Uh, educator. Um, when I was educating, I often I tell this story a lot, but um, I, I would get really tired at the end of any unit because then you're getting prepared for the next unit. And I started realizing at the end of the day that I was just teaching empire after empire after empire. I was a world history teacher and it was really frustrating. And I, I couldn't understand that of all of the centuries of history that we have as human beings, that the only thing worthy of discussing were empires around the world that this was like the pinnacle of, of all human achievement, right? Just these empires. And so um, it, it, it took a lot out of me, and, but it also helped me understand, like I can kind of see why, that, why that's happening, right? And, and to understand that there is a need to really consider how we even structure our curriculum today. And so people will ask me, can we decolonize education, classroom education? And, Sometimes I want to say, I, I don't know. We can't do it until we actually consider the structure in which we're building around it. If I have to teach about the Greeks and then the Romans and then the Mongol Empire and then the <laughs> empires of China and then, you know, and then all around the world, like, it's just these, these kind of pinnacles of, of civilization. And the, the idea that the only civilizations worthy of discussion are our are, are empire civilization. So I, I like to at least get those conversations started with educators uh, to consider um, how we talk about um, settler colonialism and empire uh, building within, within the um, 
classroom. And I often use this painting uh, for uh, what I, uh, what we call um, visual thinking strategies in which we think about, you know, how do we remember the past? You know, this is uh, uh, called the, the Vandal Sack. Uh, the sacking of Rome, and um, it, 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 it depicts the, the Vandals. Um, they're a group of Germanic peoples um, actually you know, destroying Rome, right? And so um, going through this, an exercise like this with educators is really powerful, um, really kind of helps us understand the ways in which um, empires are very much glorified. And so um, thinking about um, the implications for all of us in this room, like I, I think it's really powerful for all of us to consider um, how we remember in public and it's incredibly powerful and it has um, it surrounds us every day even if we don't necessarily know it and whether we're looking at historical markers or we're looking at local histories um, we can see how colonization has impacted the ways in which we remember um, indigenous peoples and how indigenous peoples are seen today so how we remember indigenous peoples are very much connected to whether or not we actually see the, the humanity within uh, native peoples today and their presence today. Um, following a different um, uh, presentation I did, uh, James Francis from Penobscot Nation recommended this book, and I also recommend it to you. It's called Firsting and Lasting. And um, it's a revealing um, overview of historical accounts in New England. Uh, and what we find are that many markers in local narratives uh, denote the first things, including the, the first colonial homes, the, the first Christian churches, the first white settlements. Um, and on the flip side, a lot of um, uh, places in New England often uh, commemorate or remember the lastings. So the last Native settlement, the last Native American lived in this home. Um, and um, it really does color the way in which we, we understand uh, Indigenous presence in, in New England in particular. Um, uh, this uh, book highlights how Indigenous peoples are written out of existence in New England and further highlights the phenomenon of, quote, the vanishing Indian, uh, which I would argue has been, uh, has a really strong foundation in a place like Maine. Um, often um, understanding that a lot of people that I know come to my museum, and I'm sure a lot of the other institutions in this area, don't understand that Indigenous people still live here in Maine and that there are still communities and there are still nations here in Maine. Um, and uh, O'Brien um, articulates the ways in which local histories in New England um, become the primary means for European Americans. Um, sorry. <laughs> to own their own modernity while simultaneously denying it to Indigenous peoples, erasing them. Uh, erasing them and then memorializing indigenous peoples also serves um, uh, a pragmatic goal within a settler colonial system. By denying the continued existence of indigenous peoples, the settler society can then refuse Indian claims to lands and rights. <clears throat> I just have one more story to share and then a couple last thoughts and then I can take some questions. Um, this is a personal story. Um, I was recently um, traveling in California, and I got to visit the San Diego Museum of Man. Um, and I, I want to note that um, since that James Luna's piece, and most recently, San Diego Museum of Man has actually been doing a lot of really incredible work, um, especially um, around decolonizing work and around um, the, the removal of, of ancestors from display, and that has been a really good um, move forward in the right direction. Um, and they actually are really doing some interesting work around cons consent, um, whether or not um, they actually mandated that if um, they were to take on new collections from indigenous peoples in the state from the state of California, they need written. Uh, consent from those nations to add more things to their collection and so some really interesting things but um, as I was um, visiting I, I did go to their museum because I wanted to see it for myself uh, and I was really excited to see another museum working within a decolonizing practice and within a um, this framework and um, I was going through their one um, ex their their new exhibit um, and I was really struck by this story of um, Otabenga. Uh, he was a, a man who was purchased 
and put on display in St. Louis and later in the, the Bronx Zoo. And it's a really gripping story of the colonial gaze and the inhumanity of what happens when we other people. And I had, <laughs> I had like a really visceral reaction to his story and his experiences in life. And knowing that such occurrences were not uncommon during that era, um, and still um, have a lot of, um, it still continues to kind of play out um, among colonized peoples, um, like really struck me. And so um, those, um, you know, those same labels that were used um, uh, for somebody like Ote Benga um, and for indigenous peoples, you know, labels like savage or cannibal, uncivilized, they have real life, like they have real life consequences today. And I knew that I wanted to learn more about, about his life. And so I, I, I captured this, this panel because I wanted to learn more um, about him. And as soon as I took this, this photo, um, a woman and her partner actually approached and, and the woman she looked at the photo and, and she started to laugh and she, she pointed to Ota Benga's um, sharpened, ceremonial sharpened teeth and she explained, you know, look at that. And she was, she was laughing, but it was also like a little bit of disgust kind of mixed in and my, my, like, my heart shattered, right? Like just thinking about even in death, you know, he's not safe from that gaze and that this is like a really um, great story to, especially within the context of this, um, exhibit, it was a story that had to be shared. Like it was really, really important. Um, but understanding that not all museum audiences are, are necessarily ready because a lot of museum audiences and the general public are so conditioned to, to seeing the, the uncommon, the strange um, in, in museum spaces. And the fact that like we have a responsibility as museum uh, curators, as, as museum professionals to create this, this new normal, right? And we have a responsibility to, um, to understand and prepare people for more critical engagements within our spaces. Um, and I'm really, I'm glad that they included this story, um, despite that, that, that awful experience for me in that space. Um, but following that, I, I just I really understand the the need to to normalize this this new way of storytelling in museums, um, and I'm of the belief that museums aren't necessarily just spaces for collecting and displaying objects, and instead I, I strongly believe that they are sites of memory, and that um, they're sites of storytelling, and that objects can help us tell stories, but they're never more important than people. Um, and that um, these stories really have ways to, to move us forward and push us as, as fellow human beings into to new ways of thinking and considering um, um, the harmfulness that some of these, uh, some of these structures have for, for colonized people. So. Um, some last thoughts around, around decolonization and, and, and this work. Um, it is emergent work, like I mentioned before, and there is no clear path forward for the Abbey Museum or any other institution doing this type of work. However, it's also kind of exciting not to know what the right answer is and the fact that we can test out things and if it doesn't work out or if we're being told like, you know, that doesn't work for, you know, anybody from the community saying like, this doesn't work for us. I don't think we should be do, doing it this way. I think it's really, um, it's really nice to know that we can say, okay, let's reevaluate, and we're all on the same page. We know that our goal is the same, right? That we want to create these, these better, safer uh, spaces for Wabanaki peoples, and we want to create these spaces that are um, gonna help people um, understand Wabanaki uh, history and culture um, in this area. I also added uh, under areas of growth um, this idea of governance. So how do museums actually govern themselves? How, how are they structured? At the Abbey, we do have a traditional board. We also have a Native Advisory Council, um, two representatives from each of the tribal nations in Maine are actually um, uh, appointed by um, their elected um, government, uh, governments. Um, and they sit on this board and, and they try and help us with various issues within the museum. But currently, um, the Board of Trustees and this Native Advisory Council are two separate entities. And so now it's this really interesting thing where we're trying to figure out maybe we don't need two separate 
or maybe there are better ways in which the, the two governing bodies can work together. Um, and of course, we don't have the answers yet, but I really see this in particular being where the most growth is going to happen around decolonization in our institution this year, probably within the next couple of years. Um, just um, probably a month and a half ago now, um, we, um, the Board of Trustees actually decided to no longer um, have the traditional president and vice president roles, and instead they've decided to have two um, uh, co-leaders of, of the Board of Trustees. And the, they decided that um, it would be good for the one co-leader to always be a Wabanaki person. So no matter what, there, there's like this equal sh uh, power sharing that's happening on governance level. So when we think about that framework, right, we're not just thinking about exhibits, we're actually thinking about um, how we're operating um, um, on the governance level. And so, um, so one co-leader would be Wabanaki and the other um, could be non-Wabanaki. Um, another area that I, I'm really interested in and, um, and I think that's really at the heart of decolonizing work is around self-determination and around sovereignty. So when I think about Amy Lone Tree's uh, methodology, I, I do see it as like a circle with the three sections, um, collaboration, um, privileging indigenous voice, and um, truth-telling. But in the heart of that, I really think there's a lot around this um, power sharing and around um, self-determination. And that means it's coming from, from the nations themselves. I also um, mentioned down here um, a little bit about reparative justice. Um, uh, in, in the field of museum studies, um, recent activities, um, we can kind of see how, how a lot of people are activating um, reparative justice. Groups like um, Decolonize This Place are mobilizing to challenge um, established institutions like the Brooklyn Museum and the Whitney Museum. Um, and they're actually occupying these spaces in some cases. And they're um, occupying these spaces in order to, to call on really complex uh, injustices that are occurring at these institutions. And so um, understanding the disregard and exclusion of indigenous histories and perspectives. And um, in these acts, they actually seek to become a potent catalyst for healing and in, uh, healing the institutional racism that has suppressed indigenous cultures for centuries. And so it's really interesting the ways in which decolonization is kind of popping up at various institutions. and um, I'm always excited to see what's going to happen next. Um, but I want to thank everybody for coming. And I'd be happy to take questions now. And if you do um, wish to speak to me more afterwards, um, I have my email available. And um, thank you very, very much. Yeah, um, you were talking about the um, archaeology, I think you get the name of the person who was taking bodies. Oh, Franz Boas. Okay, and, and and you use the phrase that they were taking this person was taking bodies after dark, which doesn't that lead you to suspect that this person knew they were doing something in violation? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I've actually recently found um, other documented. Um, explorers from the Arctic and, and people that were also collecting explicit, explicitly writing that they had to do it under the cover of dark because communities did not want them doing that. And if you want to continue to collect all these oral traditions and record them, but you also want, you know, these bodies for study and to put in the collections, what are you going to do? You're going to do it by deception. You're going to do it, you know, by by the cover of night, right, and, and in secret. And so um, you're absolutely right, though. And, and that actually tells me that he knew that if, if, if they knew, then they would be activating their own like, self-determination and saying, no, you can't be here. Well, you need to return those, you know? So, um, but I'm glad you picked that out, because as when I was writing that down, I, I absolutely thought of that, too. He knew, he knew, but also, Nobody else, in, like his colleagues, weren't necessarily calling him out for doing it, right? Because he was writing about it. So. Um, I work in the field of conservation, and we've been thinking about um, how to be better collaborate, collaborators with indigenous people. And I, one thing that is just a challenge is the idea of collaboration is so important, and raising indigenous voice is so important, mm. and yet um, capacity is. Uh, limited in Wabanaki communities in Maine, and therefore 
we want to make sure we're compensating well, and we also want to. Uh, it's just it's just a challenge, and I wonder if you've had that at the Abbey Museum too, where you're asking for that collaboration, but there's not always enough capacity to provide to provide it. Yeah, we're constantly kind of confronting that too. And it feels like, oh, we're working with the same people over and over again, but you know, they're the ones you work with. And, and, and no, we absolutely confront that. And it's, it's really hard when you know that you're working with people that are already collaborating with uh, like, you know, 10 other museums or other institutions across the state, or um, they're, they're working on all, all the projects within their community, which should always be their priority and is, quite frankly, is their priority for like their duties within their, their own communities. Um, and uh, we, we do, um, but I'm glad you mentioned compensation because often people will think that, you know, oh, you, you just want to work with me because you want us to do this right, but you need to, you need to compensate indigenous people for their work. They are compensated for their time and their travel when they come to Native advisory meetings, like the in-person um, advisory meetings. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> The what? The big book of artifacts. The big book of artifacts. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. It was used at that one exhibit. Um, I'm not sure which one we're thinking of. It was like the, it was. I was there at one point, and they did a, a lecture series around it, and they had brought in. They were. They had could choose out of this massive oh. book. And I didn't know if he knew the size of the book because I remember them telling me the size, and it was just so amazing. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not I'm familiar, familiar with that particular exhibit. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Do you know if the Port Museum of Art is working on decolonization? I know that um, they are definitely working towards including more indigenous um, artists in their, um, especially around. Um, Forgive me. What's the show that they do annually with main artists? The, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the biennial, <laughs> um, and trying to include more um, um, native artists. And and um, when thinking about like all the different types of museums, art museums kind of have their own um, issues and, and complications that um, they as, as um, institutions that get to define what art is and what craft is, and this idea of like what high art is or what's even native art. Is it just any art that a native person does, or does it have to be traditional? Like there are a lot of things that you know, the art world kind of has to, to work around and, and, and consider because there's, there's a lot of power in being able to name something as indigenous art or saying it's not art, right? There's a, a incredible amounts of, of power in that. But I do know that they, they're trying very hard to, to include more indigenous um, artists. <laughs> yeah, have you come across any literature on decolonizing state-run Institutions. State run state museums. Oh, that's a good one. I have not run all across literature around it. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, we do know them, yes, and um, um, and in just just this year, they've really been starting to to think about the ways in in which what what is actually in their collections and, and working with Wabanaki people, and a lot of that comes down to uh, being compliant with NAGPRA, uh, but within the the spirit of the law, right? And so understanding that um, this is where Wabanaki people want want uh, institutions to start, right? Yeah, you have to return the ancestors first. Um, so with the Abbey Museum being an uh, affiliate of the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. um, is there any um, part of sort of the Smithsonian organization that um, provides support or <coughs> extra amplification of voice around this work for the benefit of Smithsonian as a whole? 
Yeah, so we're part of the affiliates program, which kind of means, you know, they, they've reviewed our um, institution and our, the caliber of our exhibits. And they, they have said, you know, like, this is an experience or a quality of experience that you would experience at, at you know, one of their Smithsonian um, museums in, in DC. And so, um, but it actually adds like a, a complexity around, um, around the, the, um, Sorry, I'm losing my words, but around around um, what people think of it when they're coming from the outside and they, they see Smithsonian and, and they think, oh yeah, you must be funded by the Smithsonian and you must get all these great you know kickbacks and and of course that's not the case, right? It's more of a promotional type of um, opportunity in which we get to do this work. But there are other opportunities as far as working with other Smithsonian affiliates or or working with. Um, with the Smithsonian on specific types of projects. And so, you know, uh, I'm working on one right now around um, indigenous star stories and, and indigenous cosmologies with the Smithsonian. And so it, it does bring about some really interesting partnerships that can happen. And I see that as like one of the greatest um, uh, opportunities within that, that particular program. So. Yes. As a, you know, an average person, that might go to one of these Mm -hmm. What do you recommend for folks to be a more um, uh, enlightened advocate or, um, yeah, I guess advocating for, you know, for this acknowledgement? Right. Um, and, and, you know, I'm just curious what your thoughts are of, around what we can be doing as a community to um, yeah, to move this forward. Um, as an educator and just as a, a museum goer, I, I always think that there is a really powerful to be able to ask questions. So, you know, as you're going through, just ask like all the questions that come to mind. You can even ask them out loud sometimes. It's really powerful. Like, wow, I wonder where they got that information from. Or, you know, I, I wonder where they even like the idea for this exhibit came from, you know. And you kind of go through and, the, and you can actually respond to, to the text on the walls itself and, and to think about, you know, who's writing these. Um, I think really great cases for um, decolonizing approaches within even like label writing is people will attribute where this, this information is coming from. And so um, I think there's a lot of really interesting ways that we can be really critical engagers when we go into a museums. And then just to say, you know, I remember a couple years ago at the Maine Historical Society. I remember going into the basket. Um, uh, they had this really great display of, of Wabanaki basketry and, and somebody wrote like, it was on like a feedback wall and somebody wrote, I think we should be talking about colonization today and talking about these really important issues of the tribes today. And then you see what, what's on display right now over there and it's really like that came to be, right? And so put your opinions out there and, and like museum people want to know what the audience is are interested in, if you're interested in those stories of, of, uh, of survival and, and continuity in, in indigenous peoples today, then you should ask them for that. Okay. Um, I was just at that exhibit um, mm -hmm. last week and I really appreciated being able to be there. Um, I was trying to get to the, there was like a whole other like, thing happening on indigenous uh, peoples day and I tried to make it to, but I couldn't, but Regardless, um, and so I was thinking within Maine in particular, I was wondering if there's other examples that you've come across of effective decolonization happening um, within the state or just like, or you know, within New England generally. Um, obviously, I have mean, museums working on it themselves. Um, especially when we think about like that book that I had on about firsting and lastings, it's really kind of slow in New England because there has been just this idea of, of erasure around indigenous, indigenous peoples. And so um, it's, it's a slow coming, but it honestly across the field, it's been very slow. So it's not that, um, that wild for me to think um, that it's still really slow in Maine, but um, I, I see people um, when they engage with our exhibits or, or they hear about our processes, they are interested and they, they want to learn more. And it's just a matter of understanding that we don't necessarily have the, the roadmap for other institutions, but we certainly have experiences that we want to share with other institutions. And um, I, 
I, I am really excited to see like the new collaboration that are happening are among other institutions in Maine and, and I, I have hope for the future, I, I definitely do. I think people um, want to do better work and, and understand that audiences are responding very, very well to, to this type of work and just the type of caliber of work that comes out of really collaborative and, and um, uh, really powerful um, exhibits and, and storytelling. Could you, could you remind us a little bit about the Adam Museum, where it is? And oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my boss is like, oh, you need to do that. <laughs> so the Abbey Museum is actually located in Bar Harbor, Maine. So it's a little trek from here if you want to ever come visit us. Um, we do have two locations. Our, our museum started, again, as a, an archaeological museum. Our original location is within um, Acadia National Park. So if you think about the rise of Acadia National Park, like the, the, the Abbey Museum actually was created in conjunction with Acadia National Park. So there's some interesting entanglements within that. But um, we are located um, at, inside an Acadia National Park, but our um, primary location is actually in downtown Bar Harbor now. And that's um, where we have all of our staff offices and our, our collections. And then um, seasonally, we open our second location inside the park. 